Good morning, everyone. I'm Alex Norton. I'm an analyst with Hyperion Research. Um, one of the areas I've been kind of diving into recently is this emerging area of AI-specific hardware. Um, so in, in the talk this morning, what I'm going to do is talk about some of the broad trends, things that I'm seeing, um, and things that I think are, are really interesting in this area, as well as highlighting a few technologies that have been announced over the last six months that kind of caught my attention. So the AI ecosystem is exploding right now. You know, every vendor, every user is saying, how can we use AI? Where does AI fit? And so as all these problems start to grow in complexity, the hardware starts to become strained. The bottlenecks are moving from data to compute to where the memory is to the power. So as the AI ecosystem becomes more complex, the hardware must keep up. So I was at a conference six months ago and everyone said Moore's law is dying, Moore's law is dead. We need to look at new ways to compute, especially for these AI workloads. So one result out of all of that is these new AI-specific chips and AI-specific technology. So on the bottom of this slide, this is just a small portion of the list of new types of technologies and processors that have been announced in the past couple of years that are all being geared towards AI workloads. So one of the important things when looking at AI-specific technology is understanding that it has to be a co-design process between the software engineers and the processor engineers. If you design a chip without thinking about what the workload is going to be, the bottleneck is simply going to move, and it's going to be a constant battle of the, engineer, the software engineers updating their algorithms to fit the technology, which is then going to want to get updated again. So instead, there needs to be co-design between the software and the hardware guys to really make these chips effective. And especially for low-power ASICs, as AI workloads start to move towards the edge, people want to compute at the edge. You need low latency, so there needs to be a, a job in mind when designing these chips. It is not going to be a one-size-fits-all AI processor. Rather, they're going to be AI processors with specific applications in mind. As well, GPUs will remain important in AI and machine learning, but they are not a one-stop shop either. So there needs to be different types of processors outside of the GPU. Power. I touched on power a minute ago, but power is essential when thinking about some of these chips, especially as we start to scale out and as we start to move towards the edge, power has to be critical in thinking about how to design this chip. So low power chips can be placed closer to the edge, closer to the sensors, to reduce the latency and allow for compute and inference to happen in near real time at the edge. Automated driving is a very obvious use case that really, really needs low power chips at the edge. If you're driving and your computer has to go talk to a cloud, the latency is too high. The, the, the split second reactions are that a computer will have to make in an automated driving system have to be extremely low latency. So the compute has to happen as close to where the data is as possible. So the power of those chips must be low to allow for them to be there. And going along with that, the, the processing and memory also has to be very close to the edge. So they need to be together. The latency must be low. And that way, all of these new and interesting workloads and applications that are starting to incorporate AI will be able to be deployed at much higher levels. So the cloud companies have picked up on this and they've started to develop their own technology as well. So Google with their TPU that they just announced the third generation of recently um, is using tensors to accelerate machine learning workloads. Now they're using it on their Google Cloud right now, so you can use it on their hardware, but um, that's kind of 
their move, instead of using what is out there, they've decided to develop something in-house to work specifically with what they want to do. As well, Amazon at reInvent announced Inferentia, their inference chip. Now, this is a chip that's designed just for inferencing and not for training, which is an interesting distinction that's been made over the past six or eight months, where a training chip that's going to sit in a, in a data center has very different workloads than an inference chip that sits at the edge. So these chips also need to be designed with their workload and the specific application in mind. Startups are also starting to emerge with funding from venture capital companies. So there's a, a large contingency of startups that are in Silicon Valley, as well as China has some. And many of these are trying to tackle small niche applications. They are not trying to build a one-stop shop for AI. They're trying to pick specific workloads that they know they can do well and highlight their skills through that. So many are still in the development phase, um, but it will be interesting to see how these companies emerge and which ones come out of stealth, which ones um, have a product that we can use. So it's, right now it's extremely interesting. And one of the main workloads right now that a lot of these startups are looking at are live stream image processing or video processing and how to do tagging and um, AI on live video streams. So these are just a couple of startups that I wanted to highlight that I thought were really, really interesting. Um, some of them you may know, some of them you may not. Um, but Cerebrus Systems is a small company that designs efficient AI systems. So they look at it as an uh, encompassing idea. Rather than designing one specific part of a system to be effective, they look at the entire system as needing to be efficient overall. So instead of moving the bottleneck from compute to data transfer, they look at the entire system to figure out the most efficient way to build a system. Iyer Labs is a company that came out of a DARPA-funded lab. They do optical interconnect. So they spent quite a while trying to get two optical chips to communicate with each other. Um, but they had some, some really interesting information about what they've been doing with optical interconnects and how it's going to change data transfer. And then finally, D5, which is a Chinese-based company that is now a part of Xilinx, is creating deep learning hardware and software specifically for the edge. So how do we make small, efficient processors that can sit where the data is being collected and produce some really interesting results in real world applications? And with that, I open it up if anyone has any general questions. Um, otherwise, you can find me after and ask. So one of the things that we're seeing is just, again, there's this heterogeneous uh, situation with all of the hardware, and people are talking about this in lots of places. Who are the integrators? Who are the people who are taking all these little niche pieces and putting them together so that they actually work together? Because it's not the software guys, because they don't have a clue about the hardware. And many of the people with the applications don't have that background. And I'm hearing, you know, some of the large vendors talk about their products, but they're not including anything here where I'm talking about plugging TPUs, FPGAs, and everything else in, which many of the other folks are now saying we need to do. And if we don't actually make them all work together, we, we just bought a pile of junk. <laughs> so there are a couple of software-based consortiums that are trying to create universal communication languages between these various hardwares. Um, so I'd say that's probably the first step. There are some, well, ONNX is currently running, if you've heard of that, and that's trying to incorporate multiple programming languages to have multiple different types of hardware. So 
I don't have a ton of information on that right now in terms of who's really trying to integrate multiple different startups together. Um, it may be early for some of these companies to even think about communicating with a different device. Um, so I can definitely look in my notes and see what I have and get back to you. But it's an interesting question because it is true that as these heterogeneous systems kind of start to evolve, the process, the CPUs are going to have to be able to communicate with various accelerators, and that needs to communicate on a hardware level. So I think it's interesting. Uh, good morning, Alex. It's Alex, right? Yes, it is Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, hey, uh, I don't know if, if Hyperion's already looked at doing this or if someone else has done it, but it seems to me that with so many companies out there claiming they're already into AI, so many different definitions and terms around AI, could we maybe, as a group, put together uh, some s somewhat standard definitions, use models, and so forth that we could publish and try to wrap the industry around it? Right, so that is definitely something that uh, we're developing. And what we'd like to do is, uh, I love your idea, Luis. Sorry. So that's something we're definitely developing. I like your idea of sitting around to the community, and let's make the community the user forum folks that attend the meetings. And uh, Steve Conway is our lead analyst for doing the AI uh, work, and so he's putting together already a lot of definitions at a high level for what AI and machine learning, deep learning is, but then there's the whole next tier on that part. Uh, this year we're probably gonna be doing six AI studies on it, on all different areas. And Jack, one of the areas is what you're referring to, and that is who's gonna really put it all together? Because right now this stuff is being built and it's being used. These are being used in one-off examples or two-off mm -hmm. examples, and they're doing tremendous results on them. But before you can use them, or you meaning the HPC community, it needs to be integrated into a larger system versus what I would call a one-off rifle shot type design. And that's something we're looking at. And I have to also give DOE a plug. DOE is doing a lot of research on this, but they're not the ones who are going to integrate it into a system. But Mike, thanks. Uh, I think it's a great idea that we circulate around our kind of like straw man de definitions and get feedback from everyone. That'd be great. Do we have Time for one more? Okay. Thanks. Um, I just, just to, the, uh, to a question before about the integration. Um, obviously, the, um, on, the, on, the, <coughs> excuse me, on the base level, that's not, uh, there needs to be a lot of uh, research to be done. Um, the one thing where uh, my company is doing, we are actually working on the software to integrate um, multiple types of different compute into into one uh, system, and it's we're doing this obviously with uh, CPUs and GPUs, but also now starting to um, get quantum integrated into a HPC system that actually performs. Um, and so there are certain um, mechanisms that are in a way repetitive that you just have to. Uh, do for all those kinds of um, different machines, basically, that you're putting together. And in a way, we're starting to think about, you know, when you think about uh, edge computing and also even system integration uh, across industrial uh, production sites and, and others, you, you start thinking about each processor as its own uh, kind of machine, and then you start thinking about what is the most efficient allocation of resources mm -hmm. across the system, and can we do it in such a way that this is dynamic so that we don't have to sort of... Uh, you know, predefine the job and then run it and then see, oh, it wasn't that great. But actually, while the job's running, uh, it can self-optimize um, and and real uh, reallocate resources across the whole thing. So that that's kind of what we're doing. But it's true that there's a lot of uh, uh, work to be done there. Yeah. So if there are no other questions, if you have one, you can come find me in one of the breaks. And uh, thank you. <clears throat>